we are at the end of a month we've been calling Prayer Month, and it has been a focus on prayer. prayer. Yes, it's a very catchy title, uh, very creative. And we have been talking and teaching and, you know, raising you up in initiatives to mobilize us in prayer, kind of taking God's word seriously when he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them and I will act on their behalf. And so we have been leaning into that. And we are at the end of our month. This is the last uh, part of this series. And we're also at the end of our school year and the beginning of summer. And for me, as the pastor uh, here, I am at the end of my preaching year. Uh, not the end of my time here. I don't, I don't want to freak anybody out. Uh, I'm at the end of my preaching year. I run generally from uh, the month of August through June. And so this is my last message for a number of weeks, uh, and I'm thankful for that. You know, let it be known, I love this church so much, and I love getting to preach here a lot of weeks of the year. Uh, it, God made me to do it, and I feel very alive when I get to preach and teach God's Word. Uh, that said, I need a break. So I got nothing left to say. So uh, you, you heard it all. I need to reload and recharge, and I need to get out of the public eye for a few minutes. It's not my favorite part of the job. And so uh, we're going to be jumping in starting next week into a summer series. We're going to work through the book of Ephesians, and some of our pastors and leaders are going to be taking us through that for the next several weeks, and it's going to be an awesome time that I'm really looking forward to. And then when I get back uh, to preaching in August, we're going to be jumping in and we're going to be journeying through the book of Romans, which I'm really excited about. Uh, Romans has a lot to say, not just about the gospel, but how the gospel integrates into real life in a secular society. And so I'm really excited about that. But today, uh, my task is in closing the prayer series. I was going to do another teaching on what prayer is and how it works, but I felt kind of prompted by the Spirit to share with you what I'm praying about and, and the things that are on my heart perpetually as a pastor. Uh, that's a, that's a, a lot of P's, perpetual pastor's prayers. Uh, that's the title of my message today, Pastor's Perpetual and Persistent Points of Prayer. Uh, if you ever see that Jimmy Fallon sketch, Point Pleasant Police, and they put the pie in their mouth and they have to say the words, and they're spitting pie all over each other. Anyway, uh, pastors, <laughs> perpetual and persistent points of prayer. I want to take a few minutes and I want to share my heart and what's on my heart as it pertains to our church and for you. And these are the consistent things I find myself repeatedly going to God for, longing and laboring over and contending for. Uh, I suspect in some ways these, for the duration of my ministry at King's Church, uh, will be the things that I'm constantly going to God for, even as we see increasing breakthroughs. Uh, these are the things that we're called to contend for, and these are the things that I find myself consistently going after. And how many of you know we are, as believers, actually called to the ministry of prayer, not in some one-and-done kind of way, uh, prayer is actually largely persistence. It's largely just over and over being willing to go before God and ask Him and seek Him. I actually believe one of the images of the Christian life is just being in this perpetual state of seeking, constantly going after Him, constantly seeking Him for yourself and asking that His will be done through you and on the earth as it is in heaven. And persistence in prayer is a huge theme. Uh, all through the Bible, that, that you don't really see a lot of evidence of one-and-done prayers. You usually see this call to continually be praying. It says in 1 Thessalonians, Paul's writing, he says, Always rejoice, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see that? In all circumstances, just this constant pursuit and these persistent prayers. Jesus told us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Psalm 26, those who sow, 126, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. This implies that there's a labor component to prayer. There's this, this getting after and this, this aggressive kind of ownership. There's a vocation of prayer that you and I are called to, and you see it all through the Bible, just this repetition and this petition and these persistent 
moments of prayer where, we, where the people of God just keep coming back and asking God for breakthrough. How many of you found that to be true, that a lot of your life is kind of asking God over and over again, contending? How many of you have been praying so, for some things for decades? Yeah, that's part of the Christian life. I'm thankful, and there have been many times where we've prayed and the answer has come, and we know that God has done it. But there are a lot of prayers pending, amen? Amen things that we're seeing happen and, in, and being fleshed out in time. And you see that through the Bible. You see this principle of persistent prayer. You see it in the Old Testament. Abraham going before God several times asking for mercy over the righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see Hannah who labored over and over again in the spirit before she ever labored to be able to deliver her son Samuel. You see it with uh, Elisha telling Joash in a prophetic moment of prayer, hey, strike the ground repeatedly over and over again that God may give you victory over your enemies. You see it in the early church. They constantly were going back to the place of prayer. One, one time there's a story of them praying all night long. Talk about persistence. The whole night the early church prayed while Peter was in prison. And then, of course, Jesus gave us all kinds of teachings on, on how we just need to be persistent. I don't know why it works that way, but Jesus told us. It's like a persistent widow who just kept annoying and just kept going after it that God finally delivers. And I don't know why it works that way. I don't know why it's one and done. I'm sure God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts. All I can tell you is this. This is a, this is a principle in the scripture that you have got to take seriously in your own life. That, that this owning this persistence in prayer. And I don't know why I felt just for a moment to touch on that, but I feel like there's some people here, maybe at one of our locations or maybe here at the Valley, where you are, you are growing weary of praying for a certain thing. And I just felt the Spirit of God wanting to encourage you, do not grow weary in doing what is good, for at just the right time you will reap a harvest, if you do not give up. So if you're tired of praying for that thing, can I just say in the Spirit, like strengthen yourself in the Lord, take up your place and keep asking until you know the work is done. Amen? Don't stop. Don't quit. Keep asking. So I want to share with you some things that I find myself perpetually and continually and consistently going to God for in prayer. And the first is this. The first actually isn't a request. The first is a response. First, I am perpetually and persistently praying my thanks and praise to God because of his goodness and blessing. I find the older I get and the more I walk with the Lord and the longer I get to pastor here at the church, the more I find myself just blown away and just in a state of shock and thanksgiving to, who, to how awesome God is for what he's doing in our midst. I find myself in constant response to the goodness of God. Anybody find that the more your eyes get open and the more you start to practice thanksgiving, the more you find it yourself thanks, thanking God? And the more you start seeing the goodness of God in everything, like I can't go for a walk without thanking God. Like, God, thank you for that tree. It's beautiful. God, thank you for the sun. Thank you for, the, for creation. Thank you for my dog. Or thank you for my home. Just God, thank you for this house. Thank you for our church. Thank you for my family. Just this constant perpetual state of thanksgiving. It's a good practice. It's actually a key in the kingdom. Thanksgiving is connected to humility, and humility is the key ultimately to engaging and experiencing God. And I find if you practice thanksgiving, it puts God in his rightful place, and it puts you in the place as a creature, as the servant, and it reminds you of his goodness and provision. So I thank God out of practice, but I also thank God so often just because God does stuff that we asked him for. And we're seeing God do so much, I don't know how else to say it, other than God stuff right before our eyes. And I find myself over and over just being amazed at the goodness of God, seeing God do what only God can do in our midst. Back in 2013, I was on a whole journey of being awakened to the power of the Holy Spirit. I didn't grow up in a system where I experienced the Holy Spirit other than the Holy Spirit as a concept and somebody that would show up at the occasional service and give us goosebumps. But the idea that you can in interact and engage with the Spirit in life was kind of foreign to me until about 2013. It got real for me. And one of many factors in that was I, I met a man named Gary Best who poured into my life, and he opened me up to the teachings of a guy named John Wimber. And I remember one night being in my backyard, piling wood, listening to John Wimber's testimony. 
And John Wimber shared in his testimony about when he came to faith, he was in a rock and roll band called the Righteous Brothers. Anybody remember the Righteous Brothers? Anybody old enough to admit that they remember the Righteous Brothers? Yes. <laughs> Honesty in church is a good thing. Yes. And he, he got radically saved and his testimony about his first year is he kept showing up to the church and he'd open his Bible. He's reading and devouring the Gospels. And then he'd go and he'd be part of this church and he kept wondering. He goes, okay, when do we get to do the stuff? I mean, what do you mean the stuff? I mean the stuff that's in the Bible. You know, the stuff like the, the power of God moving and life and vitality and joy and breakthrough and deliverance and healing and all the God stuff. When do we get to do that? And I remember it just stirred something in my heart. Not to say that I hadn't seen God do stuff, but I just had this sense that there is so much more to experience in the kingdom life. And God just started to open something up where I began in that season of my life and our whole church began to sort of take this posture of God. We're asking for more. We thank you for what you've done to this point, but we say it's not enough. We want to experience more. We want to experience the stuff of the kingdom. We want to see healings and salvations and transformations and freedom from addiction. We want to see whole families saved and generational curses broken. We want to see prophetic words. We want to see people activated in their gifts. We want all of it. If it's of you, we want it. That began to be my prayer and our prayer as a church. And here's the good news. As we have sought the stuff, not the stuff, the giver, but as we have sought him for more, he has been faithful to give us more and more evidence of his spirit at work in us. We have seen it so much. There is often so much testimony of what God is doing in our midst that we lose track of it. We have had to shift our Tuesday morning staff meetings predominantly into testimony time just so that we can keep track of some of the wonders of what God is doing across all of our locations. And many times we will go down with an agenda for our staff meeting when we all meet, trying to get some stuff done, and we don't get past testimonies. They just start snowballing and more and more stories about what God is doing in Halifax and in Charlottetown and then in the St. Stephen and on the west side and here at the valley and even beyond with our online scope and reach. It's amazing what God is doing in our midst, y'all. It's amazing what God is doing. I had an, a, a moment, two weekends in a row back in April, we had special guests with, I had special guests with me at church. The first weekend was a, was a weekend in April, and I'm sitting over on this side of the worship center here at the Valley, and Shayla Visser, the director of uh, Alpha Canada, was worshiping there, standing with me and Melanie, and as we were worshiping, and then she was really moved, and then afterward we went out to lunch, and she she, she leaned in and she said, so was today unusual at your church? I said, no, it was just a normal Sunday in April. She goes, that's not normal. I travel this whole country and beyond, and what God is doing here is special. There is something significant going on. It's not, she said, that's not normal, you know. And it just, again, reminded me, you can grow complacent and you can grow familiar with the works of God. The, the, the people of Israel got so used to a pillar of fire and a cloud that it's like, oh yeah, it's just God. God, help us not lose the wonder of your works in our midst. The very next weekend, Daryl Johnson was here for our XY men's conference, and he came to, he, uh, he passed up speaking opportunity in Atlantic Canada because he wanted to attend King's Church and see what was going on. And he, he was standing there while we were worshiping, and he leaned over, and he just with this, this grandfatherly smile just said to me, this is not your usual church. And I said, amen. And may it never be. May we continue to see the power and the presence of God manifested in our midst. May we continue to see God do great and mighty things in our midst. And may we never lose the wonder of that. And may we constantly be in a state of amazement every time one person accepts Christ. And one person gets baptized. And one person starts to learn how to walk in the ways of Jesus. Like, let us not lose the wonder of that. We have... Um, available for our, our church family right now. It's on our website. If you go to kingschurch.cc, uh, you can access what is called our annual, uh, our annual report. I might be able to bring it up on the screen just to show you. If you go to kingschurch.cc, 
and you click on the link that says annual report. Hopefully we'll bring that up here in just a second. And you can work down through the annual report. It's really well done. It's the, our statistical and testimony report from uh, May 2023 to April 2024. So you, I'd love it if you would go and take some time just to give God glory and get a, get a bit of a snapshot from the 60,000-foot view what God is doing around our church. You go to the thing and you scroll down and it'll give you, uh, it sort of generates all this uh, cool stuff. You can take some time to look at. We don't have time for that this morning because I want to get to my other prayer points. But I want to invite you to go through and look at some of this stuff and just give God glory. There's some testimony from uh, all of our locations in here. Uh, you can go and you can look at some of our statistics, our numbers, things that uh, we've done in our prophetic ministry area. Over 250 people this year went through Freedom Prayer Ministry. If you're not familiar with what that is, it is making yourself uh, available to uh, have a facilitated, guided time of prayer where the Spirit of the Lord will speak to you. God the Father will say something to you. We had, over, we had 250 people go through that this year and just experience the incredible breakthrough that comes from a word from the Father. Nothing changes you like hearing in your heart of hearts like a rhema word from God. And I want to encourage those of you who've never gone through this ministry or training up people at all of our locations to facilitate this. That's the dream. And uh, it's been incredible. But we have seen people equipped in the work of God and in the, in the flowing with the Spirit. We've done... Um, a lot of our prophetic training nights at all of our locations, we've had 220 people come out to one of those things. Uh, it's been uh, an incredible time. If you have time this afternoon, go look. There's testimonies. You can scroll to the, to the left, whatever that way is, and you can get some testimonies. Uh, some of our statistics this year, as far as numbers go, oh, Spanish Grand Prix is happening, okay. Uh, <laughs> excellent, TSN. Hey, I'm a sports guy, what can I say? Uh, this is much more important than the Spanish Grand Prix, in my opinion. Uh, this year, we've seen growth in our weekend attendance at all of our locations. We've, had, we've averaged, if you can count our high point days and all of it, 3,001 uh, weekend attendance at all of our locations together. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, Midweek, 430 people on average. Here's the stuff that I think we just need to really just give God glory. It says in the scripture that there is Joy before the angels when one person uh, comes and returns to the Father. This year we saw 221 people that we know of uh, decide to turn their lives to Jesus and say, I'm going to follow you. Come on, somebody. And then to me, the even greater number, in, in my opinion, is that we saw 224 people enter the waters of baptism. We did a baptism weekend in November and we did one in April. So that's in a very small window of time, 224 people stepped into the waters. Y'all, don't, don't get sticker shock here. Don't like let that just fall into a number. Every one of those numbers, like every number is a name of a person that God has been working in their lives to bring to that moment of redemption. That's an incredible thing that we need to just not lose the wonder of. Can I get an amen? God, keep doing it too. Thank you for what you're doing. God continues to expand our reach online. I'm really thankful for the ministry. I'm, I'm growing more and more thankful for the ministry of what uh, Pastor Ron does and Shay and the whole online team. It's so meaningful. There's a group of you that tune in every single week. This is your church. You, you give, you walk with us, and it's an incredible thing that we're seeing happen. Uh, we get to practice love and generosity. You can go and look at some of the fun things we've done. We provided 4,156 meals this year which is really fun. We provided uh, 119 kids received pajamas and Christmas toys last Christmas, 53 turkey dinners for families, really exciting and fun stuff. I don't have time to look at all this today, so I really encourage you to, you to go and have a proper look at what God is doing. I just want to bring some attention to it. We facilitated Love Atlantic this past year, which is super fun. You can see in here different ministries that we got to support this year, both local and global. You see how God is growing our community together? Here's some fun facts. Uh, we had over 1,100 people connected to different uh, like gatherings outside of the weekend services, which is really fun and exciting. Uh, it takes 1,015 volunteer positions to run our regular ministries. Uh, so that's really cool. So if you're volunteering, maybe you're wearing two or three hats, God bless you. Thank you. If you're not volunteering, what's wrong with you? Help us out. Let's go. It's your church. Jump in. 
Now, we want you, it's actually, it's more, we want something for you, actually. We, it's, something shifts when you learn to serve the community. And quite honestly, the lower the role, the better. I, I think some of the most beautiful things, we've got, we've, got comp, we've got guys that work like way high up the corporate ladder at Fortune 500 companies that park cars every week. That is a beautiful thing. You know, we've got guys that bounce babies on their knees that if we paid them per hour, it would empty our budget. You know, like... <laughs> It's an incredible thing. It's a, it's a glorious offering to God. And I want, you, I want you to be part of that. But it's really cool how God is building our community. Uh, our giving has grown this year. Our regular tithes and offerings, uh, just about $4 million this year, which is really incredible. I want to just give God glory for his faithfulness. Uh, in 2012, when I became senior pastor, our annual operating footprint was about $600 and some thousand dollars. And our board just marveled this past board meeting at how year over year, there has not been a year where we have not seen increase in giving every single year. For 12 years, y'all, every single year, even through the global pandemic, uh, we've seen God just grow us, uh, grow our giving, which is incredible. We also have been able to just give away uh, over 10% of that to outside organizations, which I think is a good thing that your church tithes to. Amen? Amen. We're not asking you to do something that we're not doing collectively. And so we've given away $410,000 outside our doors. Celebrate Recovery, we honor you. Uh, I wish we could get more HD testimonies from Celebrate Recovery, but uh, one of the challenges of, of that is we want to keep some privacy as people work their stuff out and get before uh, community and hopefully find Jesus. But the stories that come out of CR are absolutely incredible. And so many of our baptisms and salvations are a direct result to that. Can we just take a minute and honor uh, our Celebrate Recovery family and our teams? <laughs> Pastor Lindsay and Julie and Adam and all the volunteers. We're so grateful for what God is doing there. Uh, we have some testimonies, in fact, there from CR. Uh, our youth ministry continues to grow as well. We have 420 students that are connected to our youth ministry uh, at all of our locations. We're still at some of our smaller locations. We're, that's, we're not there yet, but we are incrementally growing that ministry, and it's been incredible to watch, not just number-wise, but to see the depth of what God is doing in their lives is incredible. I, I continue to, ah, oh, I'm going to cry, don't cry. I continue to marvel as I watch my own kids who are very involved in the youth ministry, uh, they're dealing with all the same pressures and some different ones even that I dealt with as a teenager. They're working out their lives and walking it out and dealing with peer pressure and culture and all that stuff. And yet, there is a level of experience they have had in the Lord that I did not have until my late 20s. And then I'm watching that happen and seeing the faithfulness of God reach into our children is so incredible, and it makes me thankful, and it makes me ask him to do it more. Can I get an amen? It's been incredible to watch. You can see some testimonies there of, from our youth and some highlights. Our kids' ministry, here's a, here's a slightly terrifying number. Uh, we have 902 kids that have been checked into one of our ministries uh, at one of our locations this year. That is, hey, King's Church, I want to say you have conquered Be Fruitful and Multiply. Way to go. Just way to go. Stand-up job. Stand-up job. Uh, yeah. About 245 on average in weekly attendance at all of our locations. Very awesome what God is doing. Same thing I'll say. Uh, watching our kids, our little kids, just experience the Spirit of God and learn. I'm so thankful that our, our, our young people are getting experience with the presence of God. And now we have in our midst like pastors and leaders, lay leaders who are helping kids understand, oh, that's the voice of God. Oh, you feel that way. You're crying because the Spirit of God is resting upon you. And our kids are getting trained up in like that. I, I'm believing that our little kids are going to experience God at a depth that's even greater than our teens are right now. Amen. That's, and that's the design. I want my ceiling to be the next generation's floor. And that's, that's what we're here for. And it's incredible to see God doing it. I wish I had more time to, to, to go through all of this, but I just say all of this to celebrate what God is doing. God's building King's Academy. There's people that are going through different programs right now, which is super exciting. I'll just say this. This is a key for us moving forward. There is a, there is a coming crisis 
of lack of church leaders. It's actually already here, but in the next decade, there are going to be hundreds of vacant pulpits all around Atlantic Canada. We need to plant churches, and we need to raise up pastors who go to other churches. And uh, King's Academy is really geared toward that uh, for, for what God's going to do in the future. I'm praying for awakening, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But if an awakening happens right now, the church is not built to facilitate it. Even if 200,000 people this week, next weekend, say the Spirit of God just cracks open and 200,000 people in Nova Scotia, PEI, and New Brunswick decide, I'm going to church today. We would not have the people in place to deal with it. So one of the roles right now for the church is to build up godly men and women, both pastoral and lay, to be able to show people what it looks like to follow Jesus and to train them up and build them up in the faith. And so that's one of the heartbeats behind the King's Academy. And it's so important. I'm so pleased what God is doing. We're going to double down on that. Pastor A.J. Thomas is joining our team. Uh, some of you heard him back in the, in the spring. He preached on tithing and did an incredible job. He's going to be joining our team, working with Mike McNeil and Pastor Anthony uh, to build that. Also, Alpha is a huge part of our ministry. We had 216 people go through Alpha this year. And again, a lot of our salvations have come as a direct result of that ministry. So, Take some time when you get a chance to go to kingschurch.cc, download the report, have a look at it, and just give God thanks with us. Let's be a thankful church, amen? Even if you just took 10 minutes to look down through it and say, thank you, God, for doing that, do it more. Thank you, God, for doing that, do it more. Would you do that with me? Just take a look at it today. Okay, let's keep going. Actually, no, let's not. Let's take, my Pentecostals will appreciate this, let's take a 10-second praise break. You can be seated if you, if you want, but let's just give God some glory and some thanks. On the count of three, let's not be those ungrateful, complacent, too familiar with the works of God kids. And let's just take a fresh look at what God is doing in our midst and let's say thank you to the one who's doing it. Come on, one, two, three. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Come on, let's get up. give us some praise. Amen. Let's go. Amen. Hey, let's go. The Pentecostals got it. We got, we got some shafars. This would have been the time to bring your shafars, Pentecostal friends. That's pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So I'm constantly giving thanks. Now let's get into what I'm asking for. Here's the first thing uh, I'm asking for. Number two, the second thing I'm constantly going before God. I am perpetually and persistently praying for us to become more like Jesus. Prayers of formation. That through the work of the Spirit, the refinement of the Word, that God would shape us into His likeness. That He would make us more like Him. In and through us. That God would actually shape us to bear His image and that we would walk in the power of the Spirit. Uh, a statement that my mentor Kevin Myers made that really changed my thinking, and it just sits with me. I remember sitting with him, and I've heard him say it in a sermon, but before I ever heard that, I was actually having, uh, sharing a meal with him in Florida. And he was telling me about his prayer life, and he's saying, I've been asking God to, to give me more of himself, that I would experience more of him. And I felt the Lord say to me, if you want more of me, you have to become more like me. That there is a component of transformation that needs to take place, so that there is compatibility for us to be able to walk in deeper measure with him. Does that make sense? God isn't necessarily withholding himself from us, but the work of transformation and greater surrender, you know, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices has to take place so that God can give us more of himself. And that's kind of the prayer that I have been taking to him over and over again. God, make me more like you. Fill me and form me with yourself. So I don't want to miss anything that you have for me. The work of God in us is to transform us into his shape and into his image and into his likeness so that he can fill us with himself. That we would take his shape. Does that make sense? His desire isn't just that you and I believe or that we subscribe to a certain set of beliefs. His desire isn't just that we go to church or we associate as Christian or we fill out on the census that we're Christian. His desire isn't that you and I live lives and die and just go to heaven. His desire is to transform us utterly into his image forever and ever, beginning now. That he would take us from brokenness to ever-increasing 
healing, that he would take us from shame to ever-increasing glory, that he would take us from being fractured and divided to ever-increasing wholeness, just as he is whole, that he would take us from lack to abundance, that he would take us from being anxious to ever-increasing peace, that he would take us from death to everlasting life. Does that resonate in your spirit? That's why he made you. Look what Paul said back in Ephesians 4. He said, first and foremost, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, when you hear that, and I'll go first here, because when I first read that, there is a religious impulse in me that says, I got to do better. I got I to obtain a moral standard. I got to kind of hold up my end of the bargain. That's just kind of what rises up in me. What I hear when Paul says that, if I'm not careful, is don't stumble, don't fail, don't be immoral, don't fall short. But what Paul is really saying is don't settle. He's saying don't settle for less than Jesus died to give you. It's not just ascribing to a set of moral beliefs. It is experiencing the living God in your life in real time on earth as it is in heaven. Because look what he says later. He says, the goal is that we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What's he saying? He's saying, I want to shape you. God wants to shape you into his image so that he pours himself out and you can hold the whole measure of all that he is. Imagine yourself more like Jesus. Like just imagine that you walk in perfect peace, that you walk in complete wisdom and revelation, that you know what the Father is saying wherever you go. It's never in question. That you have power and you walk in, 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 in a knowledge of intimacy with God like you never imagined, that you are full of glory and purpose and meaning. Y'all, that's what you were made for. And that's what Jesus died that you would have. You're called to abundance and glory and power and infinite mercy and compassion and love and truth and purpose and meaning to be fully like Jesus and filled with Jesus. That's why you were redeemed. That's an incredible, incredible thought. The tragedy is how often we settle for less. Amen? We settle for less and we, and we miss out on what Jesus offers us the fullness of life. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a huge C.S. Lewis fan. And one of my favorite quotes he ever said, this changed my life when I read it. He's talking about sinfulness and talking about what we do with our desires. And look what he said. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition and inf when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Do you catch what he's saying? He's saying we'll, we'll just settle for things that are less than the glorious standard that God has for us. That there's joy offered to you, infinite joy and infinite meaning, and we'll trade that away for things that are less than. So why am I saying that? You know what one of my primary prayers for us as a church, and I start with myself, I pray for holy discontentment. That you would not be satisfied with what the earth has to offer you in place of what you are made for. You are made for the king of glory. You are made to experience the Lord of all the earth, the king of heaven and earth. You are made to walk in fullness. Let us not settle for mud pies, amen? And so I'm constantly praying, God, shape us into your image. Make us more like you and make us perpetually not satisfied. How many of you know God simultaneously satisfies you in ways that nothing else can and he makes you hungry again? He's constantly making you deep calls to deep. Just when you think you got to the deep end, you realize, oh, it's still pretty shallow. He's taken me deeper. That's what you're invited to, the perpetual pursuit and experience of more. Okay, number three. I'm, I'm going to move quickly. So I'm asking him to make us more like him. I'm also perpetually and persistently praying for more unity, diversity, and communal maturity. I'm praying prayers of unification. I'm constantly asking God to, 
to bring us together, to unify us. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus prayed for unity, Jesus planned on unity, and Jesus promises unity. That's a whole sermon we don't have time for today, but Jesus' prayer with the disciples, do you remember what it was? Let them be one as you and I are one. That was his prayer, and that was his plan. He said, the world will know that you are mine because of the way you love one another. And he said, go into all the world and reach all nations with the gospel of Jesus and unify them in myself. This is an all nations religion, amen? Do you know that Christianity is the only global religion that has no like cultural epicenter? It's everywhere. It's Asian, it's North American, it's South American, it's European, it's, it's African, it's Australian, it's Antarctican for the if 10 people that are there. It's every part of the earth. This is the design of God, that unity would happen through great diversity. And he promised that in the end, that will be the case. Revelation 7 gives us a picture. I saw every tribe, tongue, people, and nation gathered around the Lamb, worshiping him. And so one of my prayers over the past decade has been, God, would you grow us in diversity and grow us in unity together? And y'all, we have been seeing God do that in our midst. Over the past decade, we've seen us diversify. Culturally, we have people from all over the world that are part of our church family. And can I just say again from the pulpit that we love that we aren't all just Atlantic Canadian originally. Oh, I, didn't, I, I, need, I need some people to agree with me. We are way better because God has imported some people to our community from around the world. Y'all, we need, we need it. How many of you know Atlantic Canada, left to itself, has been largely stuck? So God, bring the nations to us and help change us from the inside out. And we've been seeing God do that. I'm so thankful for our, community, our people and our members of our church family from all around the world. We have gotten diverse culturally. We've gotten diverse from backgrounds. We have people who grew up atheist. We have people who grew up Catholic. We have people who grew up Presbyterian, Baptist, Wesleyan, Pentecostal, everything. And we have settled together in this beautiful conglomerate melding pot crock pot called King's Church. And I love it. I love the unique culture that we are because of the diversity that God has brought together. It's an incredible thing that we've seen. And God has brought generations. We, we aren't just an old church. You know, if you visit a lot of churches, it's very gray. I'm thankful that we have grandparents and we have people from, you know, the builder and boomer generation in our midst. I am so thankful, but I'm glad that we also have Gen Xers. Where are my Gen Xers at? <laughs> <laughs> I wear my sunglasses at night. No. So that's for you. All right. We got Gen, we got millennials. Hey, I'm an early millennial. We got Gen Z, we got Gen Alpha, and next year we will have Gen Beta in our midst. That's the way it's supposed to be, y'all. It's the generations that God's, God's design is that we are one together. Here's what I've learned about unity and diversity in the church. There is power and glory and beauty in kingdom diversity. Amen? It's absolutely incredible. God does something special through diversity. There's a glory that gets released in our unity in that diversity. However, here's also what I found. It's hard. It's very hard. Look, look what Paul says in his letter. He says, verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That, is, that sounds hard. That sounds like effort. It sounds very countercultural, doesn't it? We live in a culture that says if it doesn't come easy, it's wrong. And here Paul says, I actually fight for this. It's hard, but it's right. Make every effort. Bear with one another. The implication, the assumption is going to be that it's going to take work and it's hard. And I've found that to be true. But here's the beautiful thing. On the other side of a church that refuses to give up on unity, there is a blessing that only comes through that. And I think that's one of the best things God has done in our church. I get pastors and church leaders often reaching out to me, asking me, you know, how, how, what's, what's the secret at King's Church? Why is this working? And one of the things I will tell them over and over again is, we just have committed 
to trying to maintain unity even as God has brought us people from different backgrounds. And there is a power and a glory and a blessing. The Bible says that God commands his blessing where the brethren dwell in unity. And, and it's a burden and it's a tension to manage, but the blessing comes through it. I think of members of our church who are from other parts of the world who have sacrificed to be here. This is not your first language. You didn't grow up in this culture. You come from a place that worships differently. And you are wondering why these people around you are so stiff. And yet here you are still. There is an offering in that that commands the blessing of God. I think about our new believers who are willing, right after they follow Jesus, to come to church on Sunday and dive into the deep end. Like, we don't let off. Like, this is, this is teaching for Christians. And you lean in and you do the work every week in a very large sense to get caught up. We honor you and God blesses that effort. I think of the Baptists and the Reformed and the Presbyterians and the people who grew up kind of on the conservative, you know, right-wing side of the church. And the way that you come and you're, you're learning to take your worship from like hands in your pockets to holding the TV. <laughs> There's an offering in that. There's an offering in that. And I think about my charismatic friends who also are making room for the people who didn't grow up in that context. You know what? Like for you, I'm not going to stand still. I'm going to worship God, but I'll, I'll keep the shofar at home. And I don't need to blow your ear off. You can bring your shofar. I don't care. I'm just making an example. This idea of making room for one another and letting each one come to Jesus from their own unique angle. There is a glory and a power and a blessing that cannot be overstated. So I say all this to say, the next time you see somebody who's different than you in your church, thank God for them. Because that's a space for the glory of God to just move in our midst in a way that wouldn't otherwise. And so I'm praying for more diversity. Can I get an Amen. I want more nations represented. I want more people from every generation, every tribe, tongue, people, and language. I want more charismatics, and I want more Bible-thumping Presbyterians, and I want more atheists that are now Christians. I want them all because we are better when we all come. I love it. Paul says, look, diversity is hard, but unity is possible when the one who is unifying you is Jesus. So we have nothing to fear. It can be done because he who unifies us is greater than that which divides us. I'll leave it on that. Amen. So I keep praying for more unity. Number four, I'm almost done. I'm perpetually and persistently praying for greater outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Prayers of regeneration. We've been talking about this all month long, but at the end of the day, in the beginning of the day, it's possible for a church to have the form of godliness, but to deny the power that makes them godly. You can have a whole machinery uniquely positioned and perfectly tilled in order to actually not experience the power of God. Until the power of God comes and falls on a people, you are just a sounding gong, you are lifeless, and your deeds will be exposed in the end. But when the power of God falls on a people, it's just an absolutely incredible thing. The things that were once impossible for us now become possible. Uh, I remember hearing Reinhard Bonnke uh, if you're familiar with that name, just a wonderful man of God, great evangelist. Uh, and I was sitting under his ministry one time, and he talked about the difference between a church that's empowered by the Spirit of God and a church that tries to do it in their own strength. And he said, I compare it to driving without power steering. If you've heard him, that's a pretty good impression. <laughs> I won't keep doing it. He says, if you try to drive without power steering, it's, it's very hard, isn't it? Anybody try? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not easy. In fact, you're going to get in an accident if you do it long enough. You're going to have a breakdown. But as soon as the power steering is there, you're just turning the wheel with one finger, aren't you? And that's a good analogy of the church. The power of God comes to enable us to do things that were otherwise impossible for us. And so my prayer constantly is, God, pour out more of your spirit on us. We want more. We want to see more of the stuff. We want more of your power, more of your joy, more of your presence, more of your word, more of your wisdom, more transformation, more broken addictions, more stories of whole families that fill the back rows that got transformed in one year. We want more of the power of the spirit in our midst. We want more. Only God can do that kind of stories. We want more miracles. We want more manifestations of the spirit. We want to see more people in, enabled in their giftedness. We want more of the Spirit. We want more breakthrough and freedom and conviction and vitality. We want more meaning and purpose and abundance and grace and the wisdom of God and the revelation of God. We want more unity and peace. And those things come as a result of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? amen. I pray constantly for God to pour out His Spirit on us. And here's the good news. 
That is not a prayer that God has a hard time saying yes to. Jesus said, it is, it is the will and the desire of the Father to give the Holy Spirit to the one who asks. He's not going to withhold that from us. And we have seen him do that, and he wants to do that. In fact, he doesn't just want to fill his people with his presence. He wants to fill everything with his presence. The whole world. Did you catch it? it said in verse 10, he who descended is the very one who ascended. So he's talking about the gospel of what Jesus came to do. He said, Christ himself, and then he said, look, um, he, who, who, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. Here's what I want you to notice. In order to fill the whole universe. That's a huge statement. Fill the whole universe with what? Himself. So in other words, this little part of the universe known as Brent Ingersoll, it is God's desire to fill with himself. And this little part of the universe known as your family and your household and King's Church, it is God's desire to fill with himself. And we're just asking him to do what he already wants to do. And so we pray God fall fresh on us. Can I get an amen? Last but not least, I am perpetually and persistently praying for awakening in Atlantic Canada. Awakening. I'm not talking about a, a blip on the radar move of God. I'm talking about a societal transformation. I'm talking about multitudes coming into the kingdom of God. If you study awakenings, you look at major awakenings throughout human history. There have been lots of revivals and lots of renewals, but only a handful of awakenings that shift the entirety of society where a majority actually come into the kingdom. It's happened throughout history. It happened in the first century. The first three centuries of the church, the church went from a persecuted minority. Within 300 years, it became the religion of Rome. It's a it was a complete transformation, an awakening. Now, those things don't last. There are seasons and ebbs and flows and the wisdom of God. I don't know how it all works, but I know this. We are in a moment of ebb, and we need the flow of the Spirit to flow in Atlantic Canada, all across North America. I believe that day is coming, and I continually am contending for an awakening in this region, one that shifts society, like literally shifts society. And I've, said, I've shared this before. It has burned in my heart. I was 20-some years old. I was up in Presque Isle, Maine on an internship under Rick Cavanaugh, and I overheard him talking to one of his colleagues saying that he'd heard a prophetic word that God is going to unleash awakening in North America and it's going to start in the Northeast. And something burned in my spirit in that moment. And everything we do at this church ultimately is pointed to that. And I'm not satisfied. I'm so thankful for what God is doing, but this isn't it. And God has called us, I believe, to contend for and get ready for a great awakening where hundreds of thousands of people in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and PEI and Newfoundland come into the kingdom. And it's not some, some program or some flashy evangelist or a church that just does it right. It's going to be the Spirit of God flip the switch and conviction lands on people and they come in droves saying, what must I do to be saved? That's it. And I, I want to see that with all of my heart, and I believe with all my heart that day is coming. And if you just study awakening, you can see kind of the way that it sort of sets up. It, it appears like the tide is about to come in. That's, that's my deep conviction. I, you can see the clouds forming almost of, of revival, of, of awakening, and I'm praying for that, and we are contending for that. And so as we kind of close this series and we think about this prayer where, Jesus, where God told us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. Think about your land. Like This is the territory that God has given us. This is contended space that God has told us that we are supposed to be the people who turn, out, turn to him and say, God, we have to have renewal. We have to have revival. We have to see awakening. We need you to pour out your spirit. Families need to know you. The school needs to be transformed. Our, our public spaces need to be transformed. We need to see addiction broken. We need to see the crime rate come down. We need to see a divorce rate stop. We need to see marriages start. We need to see babies be born. We need to see you do a transformative work in our society, and we won't stop stop until we see it. And so I want to close off this series, and I'm going to ask all of our locations, if you stand with me, I want us to pray for these five things together. Let's pray. 
Let's pray and thank the Lord for all he's done. Let's pray and ask God to make us more like Jesus. And let's pray that he unifies us and then we'll pray for a fresh outpouring of the spirit that flows into our region. Let's pray. So Father, we come to you first and foremost and we say thank you. Would you just thank him with us, with me? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in Halifax. Thank you for what you're doing in PEI. Thank you for what you're doing in St. Stephen. Thank you for how you're moving on the west side of St. John. And thank you for what you're doing in the valley. Thank you for all of our brothers and sisters that are part of things online. We just give you thanks for the hand of God. We are seeing your hand of God move. We thank you for all the souls that got saved this year. We thank you for all the baptisms. We thank you for the way that we, you, you got to use us in our neighborhoods, Lord, being generous. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the testimonies of miracles. Thank you for the testimonies of breakthrough. Thank you for what you've done, God. We give you great thanks. And we just pause and we just say, you are great and you are awesome. And we have seen and experienced the goodness of God in the land of the living. We thank you, Lord. But now, God, we come and we say, we know that we know you're not done. And so we pray right now, would you first and foremost, would you bring more transformation to us? Would you make us more like Jesus? Would you just ask that, God, make me more like you. Transform me. God, I pray for holy discontentment in our church, that we would never be satisfied with anything less than that for which you died to give us. Lord, would you just burst the bubbles of delusion to think that created things can satisfy what only the creator can satisfy? Lord, would you bring order to our desires? Would you help us satisfy them? Would we not be so easily pleased, but would we learn to turn to you like never before and drink from deeper wells and dig deeper wells and pursue you afresh and anew? And so, Father, we ask, would you make us more like you? Lord, we give you thanks for the way that you've diversified this church. And Lord, we just thank you that it is on your heart to bring us as one, even as you are one. And so, Lord, we thank you for the nations and the generations and the backgrounds represented here, Lord. And we pray, God, would you increase the diversity even as you increase our love for one another? Would you make us one as you are one, Lord? Would you do that in us? God, we want to see more people from all around the world. We want to see more of the generations represented, every single generation. We're not targeting one. We want all of them represented. Lord, would you do a fresh work of unity in our church? Lord, where the enemy tries to build up division, would you tear it down? God, would you give us eyes to see each other the way you see us? Help us value each other the way you value us. Lord, where, where those critical spirits and selfishness so easily rise up in us, Lord, would you help create a culture that just disarms that in Jesus' name? Father, we ask right now, would you just ask him, maybe even open your hands up for a fresh filling of the Spirit. God, would you pour your Spirit out on us? Would you fill us to the full measure of all the fullness of God? Would we know your presence like never before? Father, I pray right now over King's Church, receive the Holy Spirit fresh in this season. Be filled to the full measure. Would you hear his voice better? Would you see what he sees? Would you be aware of what the Father is doing in every moment? And I pray for grace to be obedient to it, even as you are attentive to him in in Jesus' name, would you fill us full of your peace, your joy, your love, your, your self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit. Would you fill us to the full measure of all the fullness of Christ? And now, Lord, we agree together. We say, would you bring awakening to Atlantic Canada? Lord, we pray for it. We ask for it. We say that a growing King's Church is not enough. We need to see the masses come into the kingdom of God. We need to see revelation of hundreds of thousands of people in Atlantic Canada realizing that Jesus is Lord and that if I turn my life to him, I will have life everlasting. We pray for that conviction, Lord. We trust your timing, but don't far be it from us that you wouldn't hear a voice from the earth saying, here in Atlantic Canada, Lord, would you bring awakening? Would you bring a great sweeping move of your spirit right now? We ask this, and Lord, we will continue to perpetually contend for it. Lord, I pray you strengthen my brothers and sisters to be persistent in prayer. Help us not grow weary in doing what is good. For at just the right time, we believe we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We give you all the glory for what you're doing and what you're gonna do and for what you've done. We pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen, amen. amen.